Hi, I'm Professor Barbara Bruns from Georgetown University, uh, the Center for Global Development and part of the RISE Research on Improving Systems of Education Research Network. And today I've come to the end of a series of lectures on how to really transform the quality of teachers uh, through system-wide reform. And the last topic is the most complex of all. It's how to manage the, the politics of teacher quality reforms. If we think back on the Millennium Development Goals, where the goal was to give all children access to primary education, think about the politics of that. Parents gain from having closer schools because this country's launched a lot of school construction. Politicians gain from distributing the benefits, uh, opening new schools, delivering new books, hiring new teachers, which often gave them opportunities to hire teachers using political patronage. Uh, teachers' unions gain from expanded members, and students gain from new access to schooling and the opportunities to learn. Businesses also gain from the new construction, book production, IT sales. So there's absolutely no downside to expanding schooling access, except possibly fiscal constraints, but you know they've been very much eased with global aid in support of this, uh, this goal. So what are the politics of sustainable development goal attainment? By 2030, to raise student learning at three points in the education cycle. Raising student learning, there's no way around it. In most countries, it means raising teacher quality. And there's three big issues with that. First, those the reforms that I've been talking about in the big areas of recruiting, grooming, and motivating better teachers, those reforms all tend to impose some costs on teachers. And teachers are the main agents of change that you need to, to to act to achieve to reach these goals to pursue these goals second is that the classroom is opaque so it's hard for the reformers and the managers of the system to monitor whether the teachers are really doing what uh, they they want in pursuit of higher learning outcomes and the third is that the payoff to these kinds of system-wide changes are long term and very often beyond the tenure of the politicians in, in office. So why would they want to tackle a problem like that? And just to put it in, back in this schema, and I've been hammering this framework, but I, for one reason, because it really is a roadmap of what you need to do to have a comprehensive reform of your education system that can truly try truly transform the quality of your teachers. And what we see in so many countries is a, the, a system where the ins overall incentives for teaching are very low. It's considered a last resort profession by many high school students. Uh, it tends to attract some of the lowest academic performers uh, who can't get into any other college program. There's, so there's very little selectivity to get into teacher training. The quality of that training is not high. Uh, it's becoming increasingly sh uh, short-term and online training, which is extremely profitable for the providers, but not very effective for producing a highly skilled, competent teacher. The academic content of the, the teacher training curriculum often tends to be very weak as well. Then the hiring into teaching uh, is often no, low standards or no standards or even worse, politicized. I remember when I first started working on Brazil decades ago, uh, every time there was an election, the teachers would be fired. The teachers associated with the pre previous mayor would be fired and a new set of teachers would come in. So absolutely no correlation with competence and quality. And uh, then work, working, you're in. You, the, what are the incentives within the school? There's really no incentives for performance. Your performance is not going to be evaluated. You're going to be promoted automatically with seniority. You, you're, you have civil service status. You have a stable job. You can't be fired. You're, you're 
director, school director is probably not going to be putting a lot of performance pressure on you or not help guiding you or helping you either because they're often politically appointed uh, themselves and there is little or no effective professional development. So what do governments do when they face all that panoply of problems and they don't have the political opening to do a system-wide reform? They work, work, work on two things, working on better designed teacher training and uh, bonus incentives, bonus pay incentives. So both of them, I mean, we've seen some examples uh, like Tusome in Kenya and classroom management in, in Brazil, where well-designed, it is possible to, to design effective professional development programs. But even if you have a better design, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be the uptake um, and uh, maintenance of those new, uh, uh, those new strategies by the teachers is going to be there if there's no incentives for the teachers to be re raising their performance. Uh, and similarly, as I talked in the last module, the overall evidence on bonus pay incentives, some, there's fair, a fair amount of evidence of short-term successes, but I don't think there's any evidence that it, of this a bonus pay system driving a comprehensive transformation of who's attracted into teaching and how, how, how hard they work across their whole career. So what gets tackled in a systemic reform? Typically, it will be a new teacher law, and you'll see a big change in the salary scale, change in the standards for entry into teacher training, change in the, in the accreditation requirements for teacher training institutions to try to make sure that they, they, they educate their new uh, prospective teachers to higher academic standards and with more access, more emphasis on classroom practice. Uh, new standards for hiring, uh, usually at new at entrance tests to be hired, and uh, sometimes uh, new ro rules for a probation period uh, and induction period. And then very importantly, I think this, this box is really the crux of the change and it's usually the politically the most sensitive politically part of the change. It's an end to automatic promotion, an end to job stability, universal job stability. And in order to, to do that, in order to have promotions be based on performance and the possibility to uh, ease low perf chronic low performers out of your system, you have to have a system of individual teacher performance evaluation. And the new, uh, comprehensive teacher reform will also change the rules of the game for, for uh, the appointment, selection, and, and grooming of principals uh, and making, changing it to merit-based uh, selection of principals. So that's a pretty tall order. And the issue is that in political terms, all of it, except the new salary scale, challenges key education stakeholders. It challenges the teachers' union, challenges private training providers, challenges university departments, challenges politicians. Teacher quality reform is inherently conflictual. The costs of reform are concentrated on teachers and teachers' unions. Uh, the the te individual teachers are going to face increased accountability pressure, de decreased job stability, more variable pay. And teacher quality reforms also undermine union power because union power hinges on the size of the union and the unanimity of the union. And often the change, these reforms mean that unions will have less say over hiring and it will have less of a voice in teacher hiring uh, because it's test-based and transparent. And variable compensation linked to performance threatens the unity of their membership. You know, what makes that serious is that unions have tremendous political power in many countries, sufficient to derail many reforms. In many countries, it's one of the largest, if not the largest, and most homogenous and most powerful union. Uh, also, teachers unions have high disruptive power through strikes and demonstration. They can, you know, in, in, in Ecuador, during the protests around the, the initial phase of the, the reform there. And in Peru, there have been 
uh, really massive demonstrations. And teachers unions have national reach. Rural, urban areas and even the smallest village has a school. And so if they go on strike, parents all across the country feel it. Parents and communities all across the country feel it. And unions also have very often have direct political power in using their, their resources from dues to fund candidates of their choice and deliver a bl voting block for particular candidates or particular parties. Even in the United States, in Maryland, where I live, uh, you go to the polls on election day and you'll get to see a little flyer with an apple on it for the teacher and it says the teacher's union supports such and such candidate. Uh, so it has an influence on parents. A third power block is low-cost private teacher training schools. Um, I'm not sure how much this is a phenomenon outside of Latin America, but in Latin America, these, these groups have become very profitable and very powerful in lobbying against reforms that would mean a tighter accreditation for them, which would mean fewer candidates go into these teacher training schools, uh, which would mean a loss of business, and uh, sometimes they will re the, the law would require all providers to, to make their fin finances transparent and show what their profits and charges and, and uh, losses are. And uh, some of the owners of these companies resist that. And university faculties have also been resistant to curriculum changes aimed at raising the quality of teacher training in many countries, especially trying to shift the curriculum more towards the focus on classroom practice. But I think we don't pay enough attention to the fact that teacher quality reforms also threaten government interests. Teachers unions are very often in a symbiotic relationship with the government. The teachers unions may control significant rents, be, be having control, voice over civil service posts, and they're often part of a clientelist machine politics where teaching jobs, director's appointments are traded for political support. And ultimately, elections in many countries are held in schools. And as the, the example from Mexico, the political scientist points out, you know, a few hundred votes this way or that way at, at the local, in the local election that was managed by the teachers union, uh, uh, can can have a dip, can make a difference. Education is especially prone to clientelism, where politicians give favors to groups in exchange for their political support. Uh, hiring people because you'll get their vote, giving businesses contracts because they'll you'll get their their support and your, their financial support. Uh, and all of these things are very widespread in education and less obvious in education than in other sectors because as my co-author, uh, Ben Schneider from MIT says, you know, if you, you, you hire a bunch of unqualified people in health, people will die. If you hire unqualified people in the transport sector, the bridges collapse. But if you hire unqualified teachers, it can be years before anyone really realizes the consequences. So quality reforms introduce transparency and reduce discretion. And so from the standpoint of a politician, you're trading direct power, direct control over instruments of power, and direct ability to buy political support for what? For a reform that you may believe and or know is going to do good things in the end, but who knows if it, that's going to translate into political uh, approval from the public at this point in time. And very often, even if the reforms are successful, the benefits accrue beyond the politician's tenure in office. So, but there are some people that are going to benefit from reform. So you should be able to, you think, be able to mobilize some pro-reform stakeholders. But actually, if you look across reform experiences, you find very few cases where the pro-reform stakeholders are a major voice in driving the process. Businesses, most businesses in developing countries don't really get involved in education reform because they don't really feel the, the 
they su don't really their particular line of business doesn't suffer from skilled workers, uh, lack of skilled workers. Parents are dispersed; they lack information, uh, and very often in many countries, middle class parents, the ones that are empowered enough and active enough and have the resources to potentially lobby and and create political pressure. Uh, they've often exited the public system and have their children in private schools. Uh, education policy networks, education think tanks, and NGOs, they're important in some countries. I think I've seen a study that almost all the education, major education reforms in the United States have had state level reforms, have had uh, Gates Foundation funding and support. Um, and we see in Chile, Mexico, Brazil, we've seen very active uh, NGOs and think tanks uh, having a, have a voice in education policy, but not everywhere. And international donors have varying influence in different contexts uh, and relatively little influence in middle-income developing countries. So politicians face the immediate costs and loss of support from key groups but have no important immediate gains and support from those who stand to benefit. What motivates systemic reform? Why does it ever happen? And the, the interesting thing is there's really no clear answers from political scientists. I mean, they say conviction. And I have to say the cases, the ministers in, in Latin America that I've worked with, uh, I've also met Michelle Rhee and her successor, Kaya Henderson. There's no question that conviction, the, the, belief, the belief of these leaders that the, this was the right thing to do and this was the necessary thing to do was their driver. Um, external or domestic pressure, in some cases, a PISA shock, you know, a country seeing uh, terrible results on PISA relative to other neighboring countries gets public pressure and gets gets attention in the media and leads the education ministry and the president to say, we have to do something. In Chile's case, there's been a tradition of student activism uh, influencing education. And there can be, the at, in decentralized systems, you can have the federal level initiatives trying to create incentives for state level reformers. Uh, and in low income countries, you can find significant influence from education donors. Uh, and an ulterior motive sometimes, uh, for example, between the education ministry and the finance ministry, the finance ministry is saying, okay, if you want a budget increase, you have to do X, Y, and Z to show me how you're going to improve results. And in a few cases, uh, there's a political, particular political interest which happened in Ecuador uh, with Julio Correa in just weakening the unions as a political strategy. So the bottom line question for people who want to really make significant progress raising the quality of teachers is, how do you navigate this environment and make progress against the odds? Rule one. This is from the experience I've been lucky to have with a, a number of uh, ministers and, and secretaries of education in Latin America. You must have a political strategy. And that typically means you must be st starting with adequate political capital and be ready to use it. Almost all the cases I've seen are the, at the start of a presidential term or a, of, a, of a state or municipal term, where the principal, the president, the governor, or the mayor is really, uh, has strong support and really wants to do, is convinced that it's important to do something for education. And is kind of aware of the risks of having results not uh, be immediately apparent. Um, so this was the case in, in Peru in 2010 to 2017, the case in Ecuador, the case in Mexico with Peña Nieto in 2013, but it ended up uh, not being sustainable. And the state of Rio de Janeiro, Rio Municipality, uh, Colombia, Brazil in the earlier decade. So you political leaders starting their term, believing they have a mandate to do something important in education. The second part of the strategy has to be communications campaigns. And all of these success cases have had leaders 
um, High, uh, Minister Saavedra in Peru, Ministers uh, Cecilia Maria Velez in Colombia, uh, Ministers in Ecuador, and in those cases also the presidents ready to get out there and communicate, communicate, and make the case for the reform. Um, Alan Garcia in Peru in the first, first wave of reform uh, in 2007, he went fully into the, ba the battle for public opinion, uh, took on the teachers union saying, I govern for 28 million Peruvians, not for a group of teachers. And they often use, these politicians and ministers often use test scores as a barometer to make the case. You know, uh, the, the, the minister under Garcia, uh, uh, Chan Chang said, you know, the PISA results of Peru were a shock and we have to do something to improve. Um, and in 2012, when, PISA, when Peru scored lowest in Latin America on PISA, Minister Saavedra also went out there saying, this is, uh, this is a national tragedy and we have to really pursue these reforms and redouble our efforts. I, it's interesting that at the same time, Peru was doing not so poorly on the regional test, but Minister Saavedra didn't use those. He focused on making the case with the test that I think had more political influence in Peru, which is compared to other advanced uh, economies. Mobilize pro-reform stakeholders. Do whatever you can, even though many of these stake stakeholders tend to sit on the sidelines. Uh, in some cases, e Ecuador had a high-level national commission. Chile also had, a, a, in the early 2000s, had a national commission. And in the Chile's case, actually, the teachers' union was invited to be part of that as the design of the reform. And Australia, under Julia Gillard, also had a high-level commission and had a, tried, she hard, tried hard to get a lot of business buy-in in support, public support for the reform. Um, draw on policy inputs and communication support from NGOs and think tanks in a number of countries. These are very important uh, pro-reform groups and have some resources and are really ready to work with any charismatic, dynamic minister or president who really cares about education. But this next one I think is very important. Try to establish direct connections to teachers because even if in general uh, the reform will threaten some, or impose some costs on teachers. Uh, you have to try to get their buy-in and you have to try to uh, explain the results to them and make them understand that they've been heard. Uh, when Claudia Costin became secretary in Rio de Janeiro, she immediately established a Twitter feed to all 50,000 uh, municipal education employees. Uh, uh, Minister Saavedra in Peru started his, camp started his tenure with direct emails to every teacher congratulating them for their work. Uh, st st State Secretary Rizalia in Brazil used to make endless school visits just to listen. You know, not to even to try to sell or persuade teachers, but just to let them know that they've been heard. And then, and once you get into the process, you need constant communication about the reform rationale and progress. And all of these ministers have been exemplary in that. Rule two, be, think very carefully about the implementation. Think about how to make the, uh, let the new reform stick, uh, pass, you know, pass it in a form not as a, like a presidential directive, but in something that's approved by the Congress that will be harder to reverse. In Ecuador and Mexico, these were constitutional reforms. In Mexico, unfortunately, it was, it was possible, still possible to reverse it. But in general, if you think hard about putting it in place in a, in a form that's going to be permanent. And a big, a big uh, feature in these cases is dividing the opponents. In every case in Latin America, the new career path was in, in, implemented in a way that the anyone already in the system was grandfathered. They could stay with their civil job security. They could stay with their without performance evaluation. They could stay in their current career path. Uh, it's only mandatory for newly hired teachers. And all the they in every case. The existing teachers were given the option to opt in to the reform, but uh, in, in both cases, in Colombia and in Peru, 
uh, relatively few teachers did that, and also in Ecuador, few teachers did that, which caused, in the case of Peru and Colombia, in the case of Peru and Ecuador, caused the ministry subsequently then to take a second step and make it mandatory for all teachers. And a way of way of dividing opponents is also to focus on the younger teachers. In the case of Washington D.C., uh, the when the when the Michelle Re reform contract came to a union vote. Actually, the younger teachers were very interested in the upside benefits and felt more confident about their ability to, to do well in the performance evaluations, and they voted two to one to support the new contract. And the third big thing, as I said before, a big, the, key element of all of these reforms is raising compensation. The big quid pro quo is you're going to have more accountability, but you're going to get more compensation. More compensation now and more lifetime, uh, more attractive lifetime remuneration. And then, then final strategy is to bundle the teacher reforms with other benefits that are very visible to parents and students. Peru and Ecuador substantially increased their spending on school infrastructure, ICT, computers, all kinds of things to, you know, the, the teacher changes would take time to really be visible and have an impact. So in the meantime, they did visible things to make it clear to parents and communities that the schools were improving. The third rule from observing these ministers up close is sweat the details. Uh, moving from a system of no standards, no teacher hiring test, no teacher performance evaluation to a system where all of those things are in place and function well is a huge institutional challenge. So the more time you can take to prepare the data, prepare the instruments, prepare the processes, prepare the implementation teams needed to implement it, the better. And I've, I've talked in previous modules about all the elements that go into having uh, a, a teacher, uh, national teacher standards and having learning assessment data that can help you track reform results and having a test instrument for hiring uh, and designing your hiring test and having processes, rubrics, and trained evaluators for individual teacher performance evaluation. Uh, it makes it easier if this is opt-in and voluntary at first, as, for example, just as a prerequisite for, for those teachers that want, want to try to get a promotion, but it takes substantial time and substantial capacity. So you really have to have a nucleus within the ministry working very hard on these things. Luckily, by now, with Chile's experience, Peru and Ecuador's experience, there's, um, in Colombia, there's, are examples out there to, to look at and learn from. But even if you get to everything, a, a beautiful design, it's really crucial to sweat the, to have a serious focus on the implementation details. I mean, a, a, an early effort in Peru in the early 2000s to have a teacher hiring test was completely undone because the, the test security leaked and the, the test was and answers were published on the front page of the national newspaper the day before the test. So, so you really have to think about the, the, how to make sure that the processes are going to be, be in place. And uh, Minister Saavedra spent, you know, a couple of years uh, between 2013 and 2015, which was the first implementation of the teacher hiring test, getting the instruments developed and field tested before trying to implement it at scale. And he says he had a huge team focused on logistics, getting the tests to the sites on time without leakage. And if you're applying something, which in the case in Peru, to 200,000 teachers across the whole country, it's no small uh, task. And he jokes that a big part of my job as minister was delivery man. So in conclusion, uh, looking at what the Andean countries and Washington, D.C. have done, their, what we'd say is their playbook, trying to transform a system with low learning outcomes and low quality teachers and poor incentives for, for teacher performance 
into a high performing system is very tough and it requires these co co comprehensive reforms to recruit better teachers, attract better, more talent into teaching, to groom teachers effectively, and to motivate high performance through these reforms of the career path that will make their promotions and salaries based on performance and skills rather than automatic with time and service. These reforms are politically contentious and technically complex, but they do transform education results. Chile, Peru, and Ecuador have had the biggest sustained learning gains over the last 15 years in all of Latin America. And in fact, uh, uh, Peru has had some of the biggest sustained learning gains over the last 10 years on PISA of any country. So it's very hard going, and it may require a particular political moment to get it launched. But compared to the evidence on any kind of piecemeal reforms, this is the, the best evidence we have of what it takes to really transform an education system. And can win public support. When um, Minister Saavedra in Peru came under fire from these uh, uh, low quality teacher training institutes that he was trying to impose accreditation standards on, uh, students, I, I've never seen this in any other country, students went out in the street protesting that they wanted him to remain in office in December 2016. But I can't be a credible person or academic without noting that there is no shortage of reform reversals. Uh, Mexico had a very comprehensively designed, well-designed reform in 2013, a constitutional amendment mandating hiring teachers only through tests and promotions based on performance, and it was completely undone by his successor, Lopez Obrador, after 2018. Over the 2010 to 2014 period, uh, State Secretary Wilson Rizalia raised the performance of real estate from 24th out of 26 states to fourth in Brazil, uh, which is amazing in a, in a relatively short period, and transformed the system, transformed the way teachers were hired, supported, transformed, actually transformed the politics because changed changed uh, the supervision, you know, fired school supervisors, hired a whole new crop of school directors, uh, and raised test scores and graduation rates, but. One, uh, in the next administration, most of the policies were reversed because it's very easy for a politician to put in place an education secretary who will like work with the union and say, you know, I'll scratch my back, you, I'll scratch your back, you scratch mine. Uh, and in Peru now in 2022, President Castillo is threatening to undo the 2012 law. So far he hasn't. Uh, but in the meantime, the binding, the second phase teacher evaluation, second phase of the teacher evaluation, which is really the binding part where chronic low performers would be fired, has been postponed twice. To conclude, the politics of education in democratic societies are very complex. Uh, re the reforms that can produce long-term increase in teacher quality and really transform the level and functioning of an education system. They threaten what's often an unhealthy alliance between politicians and organized teacher groups. So launching and sustaining key reforms poses political risks and the payoffs are diffuse and long-term. But there are enough cases out there showing us that education systems that succeed in managing the politics can reap big long-term gains in human capital, social equity, and economic growth. Thank you very much.